Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us for tonight's event, A People's Guide to Greater Boston. We would like to thank QATV, who have assisted us with all of our live streaming events, and also the Friends of the Library, whose work for us make programs like this possible. And if you'd like to become a friend, we have brochures by the door. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers for tonight. Joseph Nevins, a professor of geography at Vassar College, and Eleni McCrackis, who works in the field of affordable housing development in the Greater Boston area. Joseph and Eleni are going to speak on their book, A People's Guide to Greater Boston. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, good evening, everybody. Can people hear me? Okay, very good. First, I'd like to thank the Thomas Crane Public Library for inviting us, and a special thanks to uh, Carrie Dossie, who's the adult program and uh, outreach librarian for organizing the event and thanks to Becky Keane for emceeing tonight's event and for introducing us. Uh, the book that we're going to be talking about came out in June 2020, so in the midst of the pandemic. So this is while we've done, I don't know, maybe about 15 events, this is our first in-person event, right, which hopefully is a, scene, a sign of better things to come. So first of all, thank you all for coming. Um, we were hoping that all three of us would be here, because there are three authors of this book, but our third author, Sarin Moodlia, who was planning to be here, um, couldn't make it because of un unforeseen circumstances. Um, so before we sort of get into the book, I'd like to sort of provide an overview of it, okay? Um, if you go to the next slide, please. Thank you, Helene. So as the title of the book suggests, this is literally a guidebook. Right? and that it's organized around different sites in and around Greater Boston, right? the city itself, but also municipalities in and around the city. At the same time, I mean, you can sort of, let me step back for a second, you get sort of a sense of some of the municipalities that we're talking about. We go all the way up to Newburyport and Haverhill, places like Lowell, Lawrence, and Lynn, and we go as far south as Plymouth. But most of the sites are in and around uh, the city of Boston in and of itself. Um, now, at the same time, the book is a lot more than sort of a guidebook. It's historical geography, if you will, that looks at Bo Greater Boston over four centuries. We start in the early 1600s and we bring it up to the present. Now, given that we're covering a vast array of municipalities and four centuries, there's no way uh, this book could be comprehensive and we didn't try to be comprehensive. Right. Instead, the book is suggestive, and we try to sort of paint a broad portrait of the city and its environs over four centuries. So in addition to specific sites, um, we take you to different Boston neighborhoods and various municipalities and trying to tell a story about Greater Boston in terms of its ties and divisions and how those ties and divisions have come together to produce uh, the city. In doing so, we're trying to make sense of what Boston was, what it is, and at the same time, trying to point in a direction of what the city could be in terms of being more just, inclusive, and sustainable. Now, there's a variety of ways we do this. If we go to the next slide, in addition to having sites, we also have different tours within the book. Right? And here's where Quincy comes in, because one of our tours is a Native American tour, and as part of that, we go to Weymouth, we go to Plymouth, and we also go to Quincy, and for those of you who are from Quincy, you wouldn't be surprised that we go to um, Maypole Hill Park in Marymount and talk about Thomas Morton. Right? Now, as the title of the book suggests, right, there's a perspective. We, we have a sort of a, a pronounced perspective. Right? It's called a people's guide. And so we're telling the story of Greater Boston from the perspective of what we call the people. And then the question is, what does that mean? Right? And when we talk about the people, we're talking about those individuals, presently and historically, who have been in the margins, socio-politically and economically, of society, right, who are sort of the targets, or the objects of unjust forms of power, and at the same time, people who are struggling to realize a greater Boston that's more egalitarian, inclusive, and just, right, as a way of both making the city and the larger world of which greater Boston is part. All right, so the plan is for the the time we have ahead of us, is that I'm going to talk for a total of about 20 minutes, and then Eleni will do the same. Right? And we're going to, we've organized the talk thematically, so I'm going to talk about two themes. One is slavery and abolition, right? and then se second, I'll talk about labor struggles. Eleni will then talk about issues of public health and environmental justice. Okay? 
All right, so if we could go to slavery and abolition. Um, as we know, um, Boston played a very important role in the, in, in the abolitionist movement. What's talked about a lot less is that Boston was actually an important center of slavery. Right? There's a book that was published a few years ago by a historian by the name of Jared Hodesty. He teaches at, he's a graduate of Boston College, but he teaches now in Washington State. And the name of that book is called Unfreedom. And in that book, he reports that in the 1740s, right, in what was then the town of Boston, right, at least 10% of the population were enslaved people. Right? And those slaves tended to be very highly skilled people. Right? So they were really central to the, acad um, to the economy. At the same time, he says that 10% figure is an underestimate. Because enslaved people were property, they were taxable. So people would hide the fact that they had slaves. So he estimates that actually 12 to 14% of Boston's population was enslaved. This was a time when Boston's overall population was about uh, 160,000 people. Excuse me, 16,000, excuse me. I'm way off. 16,000. So we're talking about the enslaved population being somewhere between uh, 1,600 and 1,800 individuals. What that translated into is that about one out of four households in Boston had slaves living in it. Right? One out of four uh, households in the city of Boston, in the town of Boston, had slaves living in it. Right? Now, as I referenced earlier, Boston was, of course, an important center of resistance to slavery by those who were enslaved, by, and also by free people, black and white. And one of the people who is most important in the anti-slavery struggle is someone we don't hear a lot about, at least I didn't growing up in the city of Boston, going to Boston public schools, and that's David Walker. Right? David Walker was the son of a, a free mother and an enslaved father. And he wrote a very influential tract. It was called right, um, David Walker's Appeal to the Colored Citizens of the World. It came out in 18, 1829, and the book envisioned a multiracial democracy right, and a multiracial um, abolitionist movement to bring it about. Um, it, was, it strongly challenged white supremacy and called for black unity in, in league with um, uh, allies among white Bostonians and uh, people throughout the, uh, the United States. The book was widely distributed throughout the colonies, even though, of course, it was illegal, particularly in slave states. And so this book became a real problem. It was distributed through sort of clandestine networks and through ships and things like that. Right? And David Walker became uh, very unpopular in the South. He became so unpopular that the governor of Georgia put a bounty on his head. Uh, within three years, David Walker was dead, not because of the bounty, but for uh, uh, unexplicable circumstances. He died in his doorway. Could you go to the next slide, please? On Joy Street in Beacon Hill. Right? Um, for those of you who know Beacon Hill, the front of the hill is where the State House is. Right? The back of the hill had a large uh, African American or African descended population. And of course, because this is the pre automobile era, right? population is very geographically concentrated. And as a result of this, Beacon Hill became a really important center of abolitionist activity among blacks and whites. Another, next slide please, another important um, asset, if you will, in the, in the abolitionist movement in Greater Boston was this newspaper, The Liberator. It existed from 1831 to 1865. Uh, this was perhaps the most important or influential abolitionist, public, um, ab abolitionist publication in the United States. It was associated with what was called second wave abolition. What did that mean? Second wave abolitionists advocated the immediate end of slavery and full and equal rights uh, for all people, including people of African descent. Uh, the publisher of this was William Lloyd Garrison. He was originally from Newburyport. He moved to Boston. And he was almost uh, lynched in Boston by pro-slavery forces at one point. Uh, the newspaper was based in different parts of the city, right, the downtown area. But next slide, please. Uh, for at least a few years, it was based on what's called Cornhill. For those of you who know the city of Boston, right, this is, this is from the um, 1950s. This is Scully Square, right? And this would be where City Hall is, right, City Hall Plaza. And if you know the, the, the steam, steaming kettle, 
You know what I'm talking about, a government center? Okay, that's right about here, and this is the old Sears Crescent buildings. All right, this was an area where a lot of the newspapers and publication and publishing houses in Boston were based. Right? In addition to the Liberator being based here, this was also the home of John P. Jewett and Company. That was the publisher of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Right? So Boston was, again, you know, an important generator of, of propaganda, if you will, literature analysis related to slavery. Right? But rather than concentrating on the city of Boston, which gets too much attention in the overall uh, metropolitan area, uh, I want to move to the North Shore, right? specifically to the city of Lynn. Right. How many of us have been to Lynn? We've been there. You've been there, okay. Good, okay. A lot of people avoid Lynn. It's, it's a very interesting place. Right. Uh, Lynn was the home for uh, four years of Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass, of course, is one of the most uh, famous and influential former uh, slaves in the abolitionist movement. He was a major intellectual. He moved there with his family in 1841 uh, when he got a job as an agent with the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society. He was hired by William Lloyd Garrison, the publisher of The Liberator. And during the winter, he lived at three different addresses um, in Lynn. And during the winter of 1844-1845, he wrote uh, perhaps his most famous work, Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave. Right. He then fled Lynn and went to Britain because um, there were so many people that were upset about the book, he was afraid that he might be killed. So his family stayed in Lynn for a couple of years. When Frederick Douglass returned to the United States, his family joined him and they moved to Rochester, New York. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, this is the highest point in the city of Lynn. This is a former Native American lookout. Uh, this is called High Rock Tower Reservation. It's today a park uh, in the city of Lynn. And you can see next to the tower, there's a small home, right? This was the home of John Hutchinson. In 1841, uh, John Hutchinson purchased this land, built his home, and his siblings eventually joined him and they formed a band called the Hutchinson Family Singers. This was one of the most uh, popular uh, performing groups in the United States in the 1840s. They toured all around the United States and they even toured in Europe. Um, they were movement singers. Right? They sang about the evils of slavery, in favor of abolition, in favor of temperance. Right? Um, and sometimes uh, their events, their gatherings were threatened by pro-slavery mobs. The group lasted for about a decade. Uh, this was also a stop on the Underground Railroad. They were, I mean, given the smallness of Lynn, they were close with Frederick Douglass, you might imagine. Um, eventually, in, in the late 1840s, the band split up for various reasons, but a number of the, of the siblings remained active in sort of progressive causes, right, like the suffrage, women's suffrage movement. In 1900, John Hutchinson um, uh, donated the land to the city of, of Lynn. Again, it's now a, a public park. Right. All right, uh, the next one, okay. So unfortunately, we don't have a picture of the site that's associated with this. Uh, that would be Town Hall, or the precursor to City Hall in Lynn. If you know Lynn, um, where the main public library is, it's on the Lynn Green, or the Lynn Commons. Across from that is where Town Hall used to sit. And in 1839, um, Town Hall in Lynn hosted an anti-slavery fair. It was organized by the Lynn Female Anti-Slavery Society. It was led by the woman on the left, Abby Kelly Foster, who was originally from Wet Wet Worcester. Um, she was a Quaker. And when she moved to Lynn, she joined with fellow Quakers. For reasons I've never been able to figure out, Lynn had a significant Quaker presence. And they became sort of the forerunners of what became the Lynn Female Anti-Slavery Society. At this fair in 1839, they collected signatures on what became known as the Lynn Petition. Right? It was part of a national campaign, but that had a Massachusetts-specific focus. Right? In Massachusetts, there were four municipalities that engaged in these petitions. One was Brookfield, another was Dorchester, one was Lynn, I can't remember what the fourth one, oh, Plymouth, actually, okay? And in Massachusetts, what they were concerned with was overturning the state's ban on interracial marriage. 
Right? And specifically, there was a ban that prohibited whites from marrying uh, black people, what they called mulattoes, and Native Americans. In Lynn, they got 758 signatures on this petition. Right? All women, all from Lynn. I don't know what Lynn's population at the time was, but you can imagine that's a really significant slice of the female population of the town at the time. Right? And this played a really important role in pushing the discussion in Massachusetts. So within four years, the state's ban on interracial marriage was overturned. Right? Okay. Uh, Next, go to Lowell. And I just want to talk about one place in Lowell. Lowell, of course, is another important industrial city. Uh, you know, Lynn was a place based on shoe manufacturing. Lowell, largely on textiles and cotton textiles. And it was also a place of abolitionist organizing. And a key organ of the, or, of the abolitionist movement during the 1840s was this publication. The Voice of Industry. It was a newspaper that was owned by the New England Workingmen's Association. It was a four-page broadsheet that featured what they called a women's department. Right? So it ran columns by and about women who worked in the textile mills. And while they didn't use the language of feminism, when you read it, right, it had a strong feminist bent. Right? In addition to taking all sorts of positions vis-a-vis -vis relationships between workers and owners, it also um, took public stance, stances on a whole host of controversial issues. It, for example, the newspaper, for example, denounced the US war against Mexico in 1846-1848. It also strongly denounced slavery. And that reflected in part the fact that uh, the voice of industry shared an office with the Middlesex Standard, which was an abolitionist newspaper based in Lowell. And this is one of the many examples of how um, the leading social justice causes of the day in the 1800s often overlapped. Okay. Now, one of those um, leading causes of social justice during the day, of course, were workers' rights. And if there's one place associated with workers' rights in, the United, in Massachusetts that's most important, it's probably the city of Lawrence. Right. Now, um, before I talk about Lawrence, let me just say that um, Greater Boston, you know, anyone that spent some time here and sort of traveled around, you know, we know that it's a highly unequal place in terms of socioeconomic terms. In 2016, the Brookings Institute, which is based in Washington, D.C., did a study, and they found that Greater Boston was the most unequal urban area in terms of income in the United States. Now, there were some criticisms of this study because Boston, Greater Boston, has a huge student population, right? And those students are factored in to the overall assessment. So whether Boston's number one or number 10 really doesn't change the overall uh, picture that Boston has a lot of socioeconomic inequality. The top 1% of the population in uh, Greater Boston has an average income in 2016 of over $2 million, right? 1% is a, a lot of people, right? Um, the average income of the other 99%, right, and that's including everyone below two million, right, was $66,000. Now these uh, disparities manifest themselves in terms of race, class, and gender, citizenship status, among other types of difference, and they reflect, uh, among other things, struggles between capital and labor, between those who own things and those who work for people who own things. In the case of Lawrence, this was a city that was specifically established by wealthy Bostonians in the 1840s. And these wealthy Bostonians eventually came together and they formed something called the Essex Company. And the Essex Company is what produced Lawrence as a factory town. Right? If you go to the next slide, please. Oh no, go back to the, sorry. <laughs> okay, I thought I had a different slide there. Um, and Lawrence, like a lot of these people, these early industrialists were sort of utopian in their thinking. They wanted to combine, the, you know, they, they were very critical, they, they saw the, the advantages of industrialization. At the same time, they were very critical of a lot of the uh, problems that arose with industrialization, specifically in places like England. And they wanted to avoid those. Right? And so they had these utopian impulses. So in Lawrence, um, a number of the designers of the city said that, that they aspired to make this the loveliest city in the world. Right? And so Lawrence, the way they envisioned it, was going to be a mix of the beauty of the countryside 
and all the advantages that industrialization would bring. It didn't quite work out, right? And so by the early 1900s, right, Lawrence is a full-blown industrial city, right, characterized by dense, slum-like conditions and really, really arduous working conditions. Right? Um, just as Boston helped Bostonians, wealthy Bostonians helped to find it, found uh, Lawrence. Wealthy Bostonians dominated the economic scene in Lawrence. Right? On the left-hand side, you see an old uh, photo of what was called the American Woolen Company. Right? The American Woolen Company employed about 25 to 30 percent of all working people in the city of Lawrence. Right? They owned three giant mills in Lawrence, and the principal owner of the, of the American Woolen Company lived at 21 Fairfield Street, which you see on the right-hand side. His name was William Wood. Despite his last name, he was, he was a Portuguese immigrant. Right? Uh, eventually changed his name and bought this um, huge house in the Back Bay. William Wood would eventually become sort of the embodiment, the symbol of all that was wrong in the eyes of the working class in, in Lawrence uh, that they were rebelling against. Right? And when I talk about rebelling in Lawrence, if we could have the next slide, please, I'm referring to the, um, what took place 110 years ago right now. Right. And that was what became known as the Bread and Roses strike. Right. On January 11th, um, 1912, a strike broke out at the Everett Mill when a group of Polish women workers walked off the job because they found out that the owners of the factory had cut their wages without telling them. Right. Within a couple of days, right, over 20,000 workers around Lawrence had walked off the job. And they stayed off the job during a bitterly cold winter for over two months. The strike is referred to, as I mentioned, the Bread and Roses strike, but they also refer to it as the singing strike. Right? Because it was a, a multi-ethnic, polyglot workforce. And one of the ways they would communicate right, is through singing songs right, in their different languages. After about two months, right, uh, the strike, which was led um, by a very radical organization called, nicknamed called the Wobblies, or the IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World, right? they emerged victorious. They got their work day, their work week cut from 56 to 54 hours, right? Uh, they got like a 15 or 16 percent pay raise, and what was very important, they got promises that none of the striking workers would be um, penalized for having gone out on the job. I should mention that this strike was uh, very violent. There were uh, three workers that were killed. Uh, it was characterized by a lot of intimidation, repression, and violence on the part of the city police, state militias. Uh, there are photos of, I mean, you can see here, these are state militia forces. They have bayonets, right, uh, as a way of policing the workers, and the mill owners who had their own private security forces. But still, uh, the workers persisted, and again, they eventually won. Now, there are many lessons uh, from Lawrence for today, right, when we think of the many challenges faced by Greater Boston in 2022, from enduring inequities to socioeconomic insecurity to all sorts of ecological challenges. Perhaps the most important one is the need to organize, to build power across lines of difference as a way of building unity in the process. So I'll stop there and turn things over to Eleni, and then we can have some uh, discussion. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay, thanks. thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, so I have to follow Joe, who's a you know, pro college professor, so he's very good at storytelling. I'm going to be reading more from my script, but I promise I will be making eye contact with all of you. So I'll be focusing on um, public health, which I think is at top of mind right now and has been for the past two years. Um, and for the first public health site, I'd like to take you back to the 18th century, during a time when residents of colonial Boston were dealing with a smallpox epidemic. Much like today amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, there was a pressing need for solutions for how to stop the spread of this devastating disease. Reverend Cotton Mather asked, Onesimus, an enslaved African gifted to the minister by his congregation, if he had experienced a bout of smallpox. Onesimus responded with yes and no. He explained that he had been deliberately infected in Africa with the pox as a matter of custom, 
and this produced a very mild outbreak of the disfiguring disease. On recovery, as his community expected, Onesimus was no longer susceptible to the disease. Mather knew of these types of inoculations, but this was the first direct account he had heard. When the smallpox next struck in 1721, Mather convinced Dr. Zab Zabdiel Boylston to use Onesimus' prescription to inoculate against the disease. After independently interviewing many more enslaved Africans, Boylston was convinced of the inoculation's efficacy. Experimenting with his son, several enslaved individuals, and servants, Boylston found that everyone whom he vaccinated early in the outbreak survived, and with it came the practice's gradual acceptance. Boston's elites initially resisted inoculation, resulting in threats, assassination attempts, and legal restraints against both Boylston and Mather. But Mather soon published his and Onesimus's thoughts about inoculation in a report to the Royal Society in London. Decades later, later in England, Edward Jenner developed a widely used vaccination based on cowpox. Probably most of you learned this in, in high school biology or something like that. What wasn't taught, for me at least, is the story of Onesimus and um, Mather in Boston. And Jenner used the same general principle that Onesimus had shared. The Mather home site um, corresponds roughly to where Mike's pastry is in the North End, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, an earlier Mather house that burned down the late 17th century before Onesimus' presence in the household was located a few houses north on Hanover Street. Now we're going to fast forward to the 20th century and travel south of Dorchester, closer to here, to our next site, Columbia Point. On December 10, 1965, International Human Rights Day, the first community health center in the United States opened in Dorchester's Columbia Point. Two local physician activists, H. Jack Geiger and Count Gibson, realized that while Boston was a mecca of high quality medical institutions, it did not have adequate or accessible care for the city's poor residents. The pair intentionally cited the center in Columbia Point in part because of its history as a literal and figurative dumping ground. New England's largest public housing project, Columbia Point, was comprised of 27 high-rise buildings and 1,500 apartment units. You can see them in the background here. While the city constructed housing for thousands, it had not built a viable community. When it opened, the neighborhood, isolated physically and socially, had no playgrounds, stores, churches, public transit, or schools. Up until the opening of the health center, Columbia Point residents had to take at least three buses to reach Boston City Hospital, now BMC. After it opened in one of the housing project buildings, the Columbia Point Health Center, you can see it right here in the building, was quickly overwhelmed with demand, seeing up to 200 people a day. The center, funded by the Federal Office of Economic Opportunity, gained national attention as a successful model of health care, one that reduces health disparities across socioeconomic groups and provides comprehensive, accessible, and affordable health services to historically underserved populations, regardless of health insurance coverage. With help from the federal government, the model quickly spread, and by 1971, there were 18 more community health centers in Boston, many with strong community involvement and services tailored, tailored to local needs. Today, we see many across greater Boston, including in Quincy, that serve residents across the region. So in 1970, a similar but entirely independent initiative was started in Roxbury by the Boston chapter of the Black Panther Party. Building on civil rights era efforts to bring about community-based healthcare delivery, the Panthers insisted on completely free government-provided healthcare, both prevention and treatment, for all black and oppressed people. The, the Black Panther Party argued that poor health was linked to poverty, oppression, and unemployment, as well as to inadequate education and housing. Black Panthers implemented various programs focusing, issues, focusing on issues such as food and transportation access. The clinic and its public health program, however, was its most successful endeavor. A trailer served as the clinic's home. It was situated on vacant land that the Panthers and the Black United Front had occupied to block the planned construction of a highway, which I'll speak to later on. Medical professionals, black and white, volunteered at the clinic, as did many lay medical individuals. The clinic provided checkups, immunizations, gynecological services, and pregnancy and blood tests, among other things. Perhaps the clinic's best known effort was its program that sent volunteers to neighborhoods throughout Boston to conduct free tests for sickle cell anemia, a disease that disproportionately impacts people of sub-Saharan African descent. The Franklin Lynch People's Free Health Center closed down abruptly in July 1972, as did Black, Pan sorry, <laughs> uh, Black Panther Party, 
chapters throughout the country when the Black Panther Party's Central Committee ordered the closures and mandated, mandated that all Panthers consolidate in Oakland to work on electoral pol politics. Today, the headquarters of the Boston Police Department sit on the clinic site. The same year, the first edition of Our Body, Ourselves was published by the Boston Women's Health Collective, a group that grew out of the 1968 New England Female Liber Liberation Conference hosted by Bread and Roses, a grassroots feminist and socialist organization at Emanuel College. Members of a workshop entitled Women and Their Bodies realized that when it came to women's health, they had no idea what questions to ask in order to find a good doctor. The initial 138-page newsprint pu publication that came out of this workshop, these workshop conversations sold 250,000 copies in three years. Our Bodies Ourselves was an important part of shifting the power from doctors to women and from the medicalization of healthcare toward public health matters and a concern for general wellness. As Our Bodies Ourselves grew in succeeding decades and across new additions, as feminism itself evolved, it addressed new topics and garnered global readerships, publishing culturally relevant editions in more than two dozen languages. Here you can see the first edition, and then this is one of the later editions that some of you may have seen. Um, now across the Charles River to Cambridge, more specifically Harvard Square. So beginning in 2013, a coalition of Harvard Square business people and Harvard University's faculty and students partnered with local homeless service and advocacy organizations to address a basic human need and matter of hygiene, the availability of public toilet facilities. Although a popular and heavily trafficked venue, Harvard Square suffered from a lack of public restrooms. In response to the coalition's activism, the city of Cambridge subsequently conducted a study to understand the scale of the need and identify mechanisms to address it. The city framed the problem narrowly as one of infrastructure and safety, choosing not to address broader concerns about homelessness, which was something the coalition had brought forth. Indeed, the coalition's name, Advocates for a Common Toilet, expressed its pragmatism and limited goal. City planners settled on the Portland Loo, which you can see here, a relatively low-cost public toilet designed and manufactured in Portland, Oregon. Its design leaves patrons' feet visible to the outside and has running water for washing on the exterior. In 2016, Cambridge installed a single Portland Loon Harvard Square and a second one in Central Square in 2017, funded through the city's participatory budgeting process where residents can vote on projects that they believe in. The city of Cambridge thus joins a growing international consensus that access to safe, affordable, adequate sanitation is a basic human right. So now we're going to shift a little bit to um, environmental justice, although this next site kind of spans both public health and environmental justice. So I take you back to the North End in the late 19th century to start, our, to start off our sites on environmental justice. Um, during the summer of 1885, a pile of sand was placed in the yard of the Parmenter Street Chapel. Called a sand garden, the pile constituted the birth of the children's playground movement in the United States. The North End Pile came about after a local doctor saw sand gardens on a visit to Berlin, where children of all economic backgrounds played together in public parks. She presented the idea to the Massachusetts Emergency and Hygiene Association, or MEHA, a North End-based organization of upper-class women dedicated to social reform. It was a time when Boston's population was rapidly increasing, and there were growing concerns that the city's youth did not have access to recreational spaces. MEHA believed that structured play would provide a valuable opportunity to educate working class immigrant children in morality and manners and thus help them to become good U.S. citizens. MEHA also thought that structured protected play would improve hygiene and health habits for children living in low-income immigrant neighborhoods. The sand garden was so successful in the North End that within five years there were 21 sand gardens throughout Boston, serving 4,300 children a day. Women's involvement in designing, funding, advising, and supervising the playground was in line with the belief at the time that women had exclusive rights to child-rearing skills. But it also extended to new social reforms of the time that expanded possibilities of paid work in the public realm for women. This first pile of sand marked the beginning of a decade of immense growth of playgrounds across the United States. Within 10 years, 39 cities had at least one playground. I take you now to the Southwest Quarter Park a 4.1 mile linear park connecting Back Bay to the north all the way to Jamaica Plain to its at, at its southern tip. It's made up of public art, community gardens, bicycle lanes, springtime festivals, recreational areas, and many other green spaces. Unlike the sand garden of Parmenter Street Chapel, this recreational space's history is rooted in the government's car-centric vision of the mid-century 
mid 20th century and the activism um, that came up against it. Beginning in 1948, construction companies, federal and state officials, and even some urban reformers advanced a plan to expand Greater Boston's highway network. The original vision had an inner corridor branching off Route 93, running through Somerville, Boston, Cambridge, and Brookline, and then splitting into an eight to 12 lane highway, cutting southwest through Boston to Route 95, while other lanes connected, reconnected to Route 93. The early stages of the project resulted in the clearing of large areas of Roxbury and Jamaica Plain, and the tearing down of 1,200 homes. Had the highway been built, it would have resulted in much more destruction in Boston, as well as in Somerville and Cambridge. The plan included stripping the impacted cities of the right to veto the project even where it ran through their jurisdictions. It would also have resulted in many more people exposed to high rates of air pollution from the highways. A regional social movement and broad community mobilization emerged by 1968 to challenge this project. Armed with the slogan, a city, not a highway, it brought together planners, progressive policymakers, environmentalists, and neighborhood activists. Capping an intense grassroots campaign, the mo movement organized a demonstration at the State House, rallying 2,000 residents in January 1969 to oppose the highway. In 1970, Governor Francis Sargent declared a moratorium on its construction. After ending the highway plans, Massachusetts lawmakers helped change federal policy to, enter, uh, to enable a modest redirection of federal funds to mass transit and away from highways. Ultimately, the movement was a democratizing influence on city planning. Southwest Quarter Park opened in its entirety in 1990. It sits on a portion of the Woodby Highways route, and it's a wonderful park if you haven't visited. So we're running a little bit out of time here, so I might skip to the last slide. Um, so some of you may recognize this. It is South Shore, of Sh South Shore site. Um, this is the Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station. It was built by the Bechdel Corporation for Boston Edison. The Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station came online in 1972. Very soon thereafter, Boston Edison announced that it would expand the plant. In response, the Plymouth County Nuclear Information Center, or PICNIC, emerged to organize against the expansion and for closing the already existing station. In 1986, the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission had forced the plant to shut down to, due to many safety violations. By 1988, there were plans to restart the station, which were met with community protests. The activists recount that even some of the police were sympathetic. One activist recalls an officer saying, thank you for doing this because we know this place isn't safe and we could never evacuate the people if there was an accident. Community resistance waxed and waned over the years in the form of various organizations. Nonetheless, activist efforts frustrated the plans of expansion in the, end, in the case of Edison and renewal in the case of Entergy, a power company based in New Orleans, which took ownership of the plant in the late 1990s. Community protests and advocacy also dramatically strengthened safety measures and public awareness through dogged litigation, protests, and educational activities. Although public health studies revealed that cancer rates increased with proximity to the plant, it was only after Japan's Fukushima disaster in in 2011 and so uncertainty about the plant's economic viability in light of strengthening safety standards that in 2016, Entergy announced that it would decommission the plant. On May 31st, 2019, the plant closed down. Closed down. Uh, many are still concerned about the nuclear waste that remains on site. Um, there's also alarm about the deteriorating condition of its containment and the fact that the waste storage vessels are located just above sea level. So to round out our presentation, we also wanted to touch on our methodology, as we are in a library and we spent many hours in libraries and archives. Um, so we just kind of threw together some of the images that inspired this book and inspired the process. This was a six year process um, and the three of us worked many, many hours and talked to many people, but it really started out with conversations. Um, Joe and Sarin started this project with what they knew and then talked to people that they knew who then kind of referred on and, and mentioned sites and it all kind of came together to um, come up with these, these entries that we have in the book but also on the website that we're still working on. So here we have some of the um, kind of moments in our research. We have books that we read, we have um, uh, entries on other you know, historical society sites like the Cambridge Historical Society that had this, um, had this page on the Old Mole which was a radical newspaper. We have maps that we looked at in the, in the library to understand where things were actually located or when they changed throughout history. Um, these are insurance maps. 
And then we also have photos that um, this one actually Joe stumbled on here. Um, he stumbled on this in the Digital Commonwealth and wondered, well, why is there a swastika on a boat in Boston? And that turned into an entry that he can talk about after. Mm -hmm. um, so these are all just kind of moments that we had. You know, the, the Blue Book in Roxbury, this was used to find the address of a specific um, site, I think, in relation to Malcolm X mm -hmm. and, and his moments uh, in Boston when, when he was a teenager. And then on the second slide here, we have um, the photos that we gathered throughout the book. So we have 100 photos, At least, yeah. something like that. And some of them are our own. Some of them we found through our connections with our interviews and our references, libraries. Um, some of them were through the Library of Congress. They have a you know, wonderful archive. Um, others were uh, photographers that went to events that we wanted to highlight in the book. Um, and then we also have some from city archives. So this one, for example, was for an entry on a, um, uh, the common cupboard, which was a, um, a meeting place for, for kind of union organizing. Union organizing and, and, but the building no longer exists. And so how are we going to find a photo of the site? So this is actually a photo from the BRA, now the BPDA's um, archives which was a survey of buildings that were getting, going to be destroyed. <laughs> so sometimes you have moments where the you know, painstaking record keeping then comes back and we actually have a photo of the building that was destroyed during urban renewal. So this was just you know, a kind of quick snapshot of how we, how we worked on this book, but we are happy to talk more. I know we've kind of run over <laughs> on our time, but um, we have you know, 10, 15 minutes more if you'd like to stay to talk a little bit more about our, um, about, our, about our book and the process. And then lastly, um, we also have more entries that we've developed um, over the past now eight years um, that we are posting on our website that we weren't able to include in the book. So we encourage you to check out our, our book, our website, and, um, and our Facebook page to learn more. Thank you so much. So we're happy to take questions or hear comments or whatever people would like to share. I went to the William Lloyd Garrison School. Oh, you did? <laughs> As a kid. Yeah. Yeah. It, Elementary school. Very good. <laughs> I love hearing the name. That's in Roxbury, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Okay. I think it's condos now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a beautiful old building. I've, you know, I've walked by it. Yeah. Yeah. I went to a school that's not there anymore. Also, the Audubon, which is on Harvard Street in Dorchester. Oh, okay. Not there anymore. Yeah, my elementary school's condos in Dorchester now. So. <laughs> Good building for it. Yeah. So, can you tell the story about that photo of the swastika? I know I've heard it before, but I know right. really could, could, could you go, go, go yeah. to that, please? Yeah, so that's, a, that's in Charlestown, okay? And we were doing some research on the Charlestown Navy Yard. And the Digital Commonwealth is a, is a really fabulous resource. It's, it brings together all these digital archives of libraries and historical societies across Massachusetts. And so this photo pops up, and we're like, what is this about? Right? So this, these are, these three people who are in military uniforms, they are German military, uh, naval officers. The year is 1934. This is the German ambassador to the United States. Right? So he's Hitler's ambassador. This is Hitler's navy. Right? And the ship is called the Karlsruhe. And it has come to Boston on a goodwill tour. Right? Um, now, this is well before, of course, World War II starts. But already, for those people who are paying attention, it's apparent that Hitler's regime is a problem. Right? The anti the, this overt anti-Semitism and violence has started. The attacks on worker organizing in Germany have started. Right? But the city of this was an official um, uh, invitation. They were here on the official invitation of the city of Boston, specifically the, uh, the Port Authority of Boston. Right? Well, there were a lot of people in Boston that weren't happy about the presence of the Karlsruhe. And so they organized. And who are these people? Well, some of them were members of Jewish civic organizations. At Boston, the city of Boston at that time had a very substantial Jewish population. Um, some of them were members of the Communist Party. Some of them were students from Harvard University. 
And in May 1934, I'm, I'm trying to find this section of the book. Can, can you find that? Yeah. Well, okay, thank you. Um, they headed down to city, city Square in Charlestown. Now, for those of us that are old enough to remember, the orange line used to stop in City Square in Charlestown, right? The orange line was elevated, and City Square is where the first seat of government of what became Boston exists, okay? Before they set up shop in, on the Charlotte Peninsula, downtown Boston, the North End, and West End today, they set up shop in City Square. And so if you go to City Square today, you can see the original, I forget they call it the Longhouse. The, the foundation, the outline of the Longhouse is still in City Square, all right? On City Square stands the police department, the Boston Police Department, right? And this is very close to the Charlestown Navy Yard. So these demonstrators, hundreds of them, they march from the North End across the bridge into City Square. This is around rush hour as people are coming back from work. At the same time, another group from Harvard comes that's pro-Nazi, right? The Harvard University had a lot of pro-Nazi Germany students. And they engage in verbal back and forth, some fisticuffs break out, and the police start attacking not the pro-Nazi group, but the anti-Nazi group. And this, the, this is talked about in the Herald and the Globe in sort of glowing terms. Um, that the fact that the people are be, sort of being beaten on the head with billy clubs and things like that. Dozens of people were arrested. That same night, um, there is a ball to welcome the Nazi naval officers at the Copley Plaza Hotel. Right? And so you have German-American societies from like Jamaica Plain that are present there. You have representatives of the city of Boston and from the state of Massachusetts. And to just go to give you a sense of how this was covered and just how uncritical people were of Nazi Germany at the time among elite circles in Boston, I want to read you what the Herald had to say about this. Okay, I'm quoting the Herald now. Each member of the ship has this common denominator, an impeccable appearance, a knowledge of English, and a charming old world courtesy. They were, referring to the naval officers, in short, a joy to the feminine heart, and made that poor fellow, the average American, seem a bit shabby by contrast. Right? Okay. Um, this is a book that just came out, written by Father Charles Gall Gallagher. He's a professor of history at Boston College, and he's also a Jesuit priest, Father Charles Gallagher. It's called The Nazis of Copley Square. And what that title refers to is something called the Christian Front. Right? The Christi people have heard of Father Coughlin, the radio priest from Detroit. Right? He was a big critic of FDR and the New Deal. Right? Didn't want the United States to enter the war. He was very sympathetic uh, to fascism in Germany and Italy. Right? The Christian Front was his organization. And the two biggest chapters of the Christian Front were in New York and by far in the city of Boston. Father Charles Gallagher is telling the story of the Christian Front in Boston. And the reason he calls it the, the Nazis of Copley Square is that the headquarters of the Christian Front were based in the Copley Square Hotel. Not the Copley Plaza, the Copley Square Hotel. That's on Huntington Ave, right behind the Boston Public Library. Right? They owned a suite on the second floor. And it turns out that the Christian Front in Boston was a front for Nazi Germany. There was a, a German consul general uh, in, I forget his name, uh, present in Boston, the Nazi flag used to fly from, I think it was on Charles Street, where they had their, the consul, the consul offices in downtown Boston. And um, the Germans were wanted, because Boston had a very significant Irish Catholic population who was critical of the British, right? They wanted to manipulate Boston's Irish Catholic population so they would prevent the United States from entering the war on the side of the Allies. Does that make sense? Right. And Francis Moran, the head of the Christian Front in Boston, was a Nazi agent. Right. And this was a, a big organization. It had events at Hibernian Hall. P many of us are probably familiar with the Hibernian Hall. It was sort of the, a center of Irish immigrant and Irish American activity in Roxbury. It still exists. Uh, they would have events of hundreds and thousands of people at the Boston Arena as well. Uh, many uh, prominent Bostonians, many people in the Catholic Church were sympathetic, like priests, 
were sympathetic to it and many Boston police officers. Right? And so um, this speaks to sort of the rampant anti-Semitism that was present at Boston at the time. Um, and that changed for a lot of reasons. A new cardinal, uh, revelations of the horrors of, of World War II, and um, with it, um, you know, changing sentiments. Right? So that's why we included that photo in the book. Yeah. That's not the most uplifting story. <laughs> Welcome people, other comments or questions? What was the most interesting thing you found out when you were reading her? Yeah. Do you want to take that one? Greetings. Creating the book? That you Ooh. didn't know before, obviously. Oh, didn't know before. Well, that was certainly one. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk about the, I mean, you knew about it, the Kodak thing? Or? Yeah, so one that I knew a little bit about, but only kind of scratched the surface oh. was, um, I think we have it here. Okay. Uh, you want me to see if I can find it? Okay. So, um, as some of you may know, Polaroid was headquartered in Boston, Cambridge specifically, um, and it was a really big deal back in the day. That was, um, let me just find this. Do you want to find it? Uh, so it was in, it had offices in Kendall Square, and then it had offices um, on Memorial Drive. The, the building still exists on Memorial Drive, and as you're driving, if you drive off the pike, or if you're walking down Memorial Drive, you'll see it. And this story um, starts actually when I was in high school. I grew up in Cambridge, and um, I had a teacher who spoke a little bit about her experience as a Polaroid worker. She was a chemist um, working there, and she told us that Polaroid was connected to apartheid South Africa, which was kind of you know a shock, right? Um, and so when we started the book, this kind of came back up, and we we looked into it. We actually spoke with um, Caroline Hunter, who was the woman who was the teacher um, that I had heard it from first. And she told us this story that her and her, um, her partner, Ken Williams, um, were working at, at Polaroid and found a sample identification badge for the South African Department of Mines in their, the headquarters in Cambridge. And so they started asking questions. Why, why is there something that has to do with um, apartheid South Africa in these labs? This was in uh, 1960, no, 1970. Um, and so it turns out that, that Polaroid was being used um, to manufacture identification cards, which was a big part of apartheid South Africa, the infamous passbooks that people had to hold um, as they passed through society in South Africa. And when Williams, Ken Williams, um, Caroline Hunter's partner, confronted the Polaroid executives, um, nothing really happened. And so they decided to take matters in their own hands and founded the Polaroid Revolutionary Workers Movement or PRWM, which is this uh, pin over here, where that's from their pin. They held its, their first demonstration outside the headquarters. This was the flyer here. Um, and they continued to um, build, you know, uh, build alliances with other people who were interested in this, who wanted to see Polaroid di divest from South Africa. Um, as we know, was, that was kind of the, the first part of the divestment movement um, of apartheid South Africa. And so after uh, building some power and building some, some momentum, um, Polaroid did respond by announcing a partial ban on the sale of its products in South Africa. And um, eventually they did uh, withdraw from South Africa in November of 1977, becoming the first US corporation to do so. So this all started with two employees noticing something in their work and realizing that there was something wrong and, and, and believing that they had something to say and, and really seeing it through. Um, so we, you know, I, I had known this story a little bit but didn't know the extent of it. We didn't really know that this was the start of the divestment movement in South Africa. Um, and many other companies in the Cambridge, Boston area did um, eventually divest from South Africa which did put pressure on the apartheid government and, um, and eventually the uh, the end of apartheid South Africa. So maybe not completely new, but definitely kind of expanded. <laughs> I think it's very informational and helpful. I, I knew of like the, uh, the flu epidemic in the early 1900s, but to hear about the smallpox vaccines and that same kind of 
reaction by so much of the population and kind of an, a revolt against getting vaccinated is, uh, I think, I think it helps to put the world into perspective. <laughs> Well, there, there was also kind of a political bent. So um, Mather, there, he had done some things previously that caused the elites, the Boston elites, to be kind of against him. So mm -hmm. in many ways, it became a political uh, moment as well, just like we're seeing today with the vaccines. Of course, Carter Mather was a key figure in um, fomenting the hysteria around the, the Salem witch trials, right? That was one reason some people didn't like him. Um, but there were others as well, right? <laughs> I don't know if we mentioned that this is also part of a series. Oh, right. So this is, um, this is the second in a series, so the People's um, Guide series. The first was the, the Guide to Los Angeles. And then um, there was recently uh, the, a Guide to San Francisco Bay, a Guide to New York City, and a Guide to um, Orange County. And then I think there are a few more coming up. Nashville. Right, Nashville, New Orleans. Um, and each one is written by people who are knowledgeable of that area. So the, we, there's a series editor, and then each book is, is cultivated and, and um, brought to the world by <laughs> folks in that area. And who are the public, who's the publisher? The um, UC Press. University of California. California. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And you're welcome to come take a look if you'd like. Yeah. And if people have idea, you know, this is an ongoing project. As Eleni mentioned, we have a website. Uh, so we're continuing to develop um, sites and tours and essays and things like that. There's a lot we missed, uh, not least on the South Shore, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we're very thin in terms of what we, di we did in the South Shore. So if people have ideas um, about things we should be thinking about, uh, things we missed, please don't hesitate to be in touch and share that with us, okay? Mm -hmm.